Can you believe it? It's been a year since the Upsilon Wars came to an end and Dr. Bad Doom's helium factory was closed down for good. We find our hero, Sneck, sitting in the bowels of Bad Taste Internet Jail, where he was confined for his crimes. Hey, Sneck, you got a visitor. Huh, a visitor? Here? Well, who is it? I'm just a disembodied voice who stands off screen to avoid being animated. I'm not here to move the plot along. Hello, Sneck. Sneckworth? And not just me. <laughs> and also me. Ah, Lounge Lizard, the most popular character on all of the channel and best friend to all. If you're here, this must be serious. That it is, Sneck. That it is. You see, I'm here to offer you a deal. Ah, Snickworth, you and your deals. I'm out of the game now. But the game is not out of you, Snick. What does that even mean? That's not important right now. What is, is if you complete the task, you'll be issued a full internet pardon from the king of all internet. No, like I said, I'm out of the game now. I, uh, I'll also get you those quesadillas that you like. All right, I'm in. What's the plan? Don't just agree without hearing me out first, you dim bulb of a snack. You need to listen right now. Okay, fine, I'm listening. Talk. That's better. Our former schoolmate and long-standing rival slash arch-nemesis Snekina Snekovich has hijacked the orbital space station cannon, the Explodinator 9000. <laughs> yeah, man, why did the government invest so heavily into their giant space cannon idea again? Who knows? It's worse than merely blowing up a planet, Snek. She's outfitted the cannon with a new type of dangerous chemical weapon, a mixture of crystal Pepsi and Ecto Cooler, which she threatens to blast the surface of the Earth until none are alive to bemoan their fates. What? But that's combining something terrible with something awesome, albeit out of production for several years now, and then weaponizing it. So you understand the gravity of the situation. Ha, huh, I see what you did there. Did what? You know, gravity. She's in orbit. Oh. I suppose that was a bit of a play on the words, wasn't it? <laughs> Skip it a bit. Today, gentlemen. Ah, uh, yes. Lounge Lizard has the right of things. Snek, we need your assistance. We're the only people Snekovich has agreed to parlay with. We're the last line of defense for the entire planet. And the frontier of good taste. Much as I cannot believe I'm saying that to you of all people. Do you actually 100% Sonic in the Black Knight? All right, all right. Fine. I'll do it. But not for the planet. I'm doing this for me. Whatever you must tell yourself in order to sleep at night, Snack. Great. I assume you're driving? How exactly do you expect us to get to space? Car or no car? You leave that to me. Let's move out, gentlemen. We've precious little time. Snack. Yeah, he's Snack. So, am I going to have to be the one to ask why your dad just has a collection of ICBMs and space shuttles in his backyard? I don't ask questions, and neither should you. Now hold on, we're blasting off now. All right, we're in now. Ha <laughs> ha! Welcome, foolish heroes, to die. No sudden movements now. Remember, I've got a hostage. You don't want to push me. Oh, hey guys! Hey, big brother! Wow, Snackworth. Is your sister ever not being kidnapped and used as a hostage? Uh, no, I suppose not. It's not my fault! She had cookies and juice! And also a wee! And a copy of Smash Bros. Brawl! Are you actually being held hostage and not just having a sleepover? No, she only uses Meta Knight. I think that makes me a hostage, technically speaking. That's just on cool, bro. Have I mentioned recently that I was adopted into the family? Due to our many various adventures together, we of course knew that already. But that's a convenient aside for anyone who is, hypothetically speaking, watching our antics unfold on this day in particular. Now that's just uncouth, Snekina. After all, we've known each other since grade school. It's true. It's in the instruction booklet and everything. Therefore, it's canon. Oh, speaking of canons, Snek. Don't you have those funnel stave things? You were really excited to play Sage, correct? Oh yeah, that visual gag? Yeah, Sue's holding those for me, but I had to cut her cameo out of the script due to time constraints. Well, that's disappointing. Well, to the matter at no hands, you said you talked to us, Nakina, so let's just ask the pertinent question. What's it going to take to convince you to not blast the planet with your 
weapon, I guess? Hmm. Under normal circumstances, it would at least take a ransom of ten snitzillion dollars to talk me down from here. That's not a real number. But, if you accept a different set of conditions, I might be inclined to de-escalate this little situation, and no one would get hurt. Yes. Let's consider that option first and foremost, shall we? All right, then. What would you have us do? I want you to review my favorite movie of all time. Sleepless in Seattle? My big fat Greek wedding? (laughs) Fried green tomatoes? Meg Ryan's entire IMDb page? No, you morons. You know nothing of a woman's heart. Snakina, why do you say things that are technically true but still hurt me? My favorite tastes are far too refined for such dribble. My favorite film is the sleeper hit Advent Rising. Wait, that Kmart brand of massive... Ah, uh, shh. But isn't that also a... Ah, uh, shh. Let's just humor the crazy lady with access code to the doomsday weapon, shall we, fellas? So, what say you to my terms, boys? Yeah, sure, we can do that. Playing dumb will get you nowhere, you fools. Uh, I just said I'd do it. You don't need to ask again. Oh, you dare ignore my generous offer? Uh, wait, did you say you'd actually do it? Yeah, sure. Let's talk about the ga- uh, movie, rather, right now. <laughs> really? You're just going to improv an entire movie review right here? Right now? Purely for my amusement? And to save the world. Kind of a big deal, I guess. But don't worry, I can just use my video editing magic and we can get the show on the road. Originally released on the first generation Xbox May of 2005, and then for Windows PCs the same year in August, Advent Rising is a sci-fi third-person over-the-shoulder shooter with a lot going on under the hood. And we'll get to all that in due time, believe me. Oh, and by the way, this game is still genuinely accessible. You can get it on Steam for just $10 USD, and the entire orchestral soundtrack by Tommy Tellerico and Emmanuel Fradiani for free as DLC content. Alongside that, there's a free comic book, which explores the universe of Advent Rising in more detail. The original story was spearheaded by Donald and Jeremy Mustard, and the script was written by Orson Scott Card and Cameron Dayton. So to say that the expectations were set as high as that stick-up Snickworth's backside is underselling it a bit. I say, I have no such implement lodged in any such place. Yeah, you kind of do. You kind of do, bro. Ugh, Etu, Lounge Lizard. And with high expectations come a lot of risks, though, including a side story game slated for a 2006 release on PSP, Advent Shadow, which was cancelled as a result of poor sales when the first title dropped. This actually gets worse, though. Advent Rising was also the subject of a really big contest, too. Oh, I heard about this one. Majesco Entertainment, the publisher, offered the first bunch of Xbox copy owners the chance to win a million dollars in a contest by finding a series of icons hidden throughout the game maps, and then ended up with more entries in the contest than actual numbers of units sold. Yep. Pirates cracked the game before Street Date and likely didn't help the game's reputation between the plethora of bugs and cut content, giving the game a relatively short runtime in order to meet its final deadlines. Uh-huh. Are you hating on my favorite movie, Snet? What? Me? No, no, perish the thought. I'm just laying the groundwork for all the nice stuff I'm about to say. Hmm, keep talking. So, suffice to say, they had a lot of legwork to do, particularly in an uphill direction, which is why it's good the story is very engaging. In some ways, it's akin to Mass Effect with its space opera and politics beginning violence. Except that this doesn't drop the ball by releasing a third installment nobody wanted and then kneecapping itself after the fact with additional sequels that nobody wanted or purchased. (laughs) Mean, but hilarious and true. The story opens aboard an ambassadorial mission with Captain Gideon Wyeth, who has a terminal case of always in the wrong place at the wrong time, which follows him everywhere he goes. Seriously, this guy cannot catch an honest break. One of the first things that happens to him is getting into a bar brawl and having to make a split-second decision in order to save his brother Ethan from a crazed, drunken man. Oh, and then he gets this weird sea slug thing implanted in his ear, which serves as a universal translator. Because after conquering space travel technology, it's only within recent days of the story that humans end up making first contact. And in this case, it's with a race of fish-like humanoids called the Arulians. 
The Aurelians are eager to enter peace talks and seem to hold humanity in high regard. High regard indeed, being that they essentially think humankind is their strange pantheon of deities and wielders of basically not the Force, except weirdly more codified and understood than the Force. Mm, you mean researched? Even a little bit? More, more or less, yes. Yeah, yeah, just get on with it. We're still in the first 15 minutes of the story. You have figured out by now that this isn't a movie, have you not? Anyway, this all goes sideways when rogue aliens, called the Seekers, attack and make a huge mess out of everything. And I mean everything. They are the primary soul and main enemy force for the duration of our time spent. They aren't even subtle on how evil they are. They just start blowing the ship apart, offing man, woman, and child alike. So Gideon takes up arms against them. And here I need to start breaking down the gameplay a bit, and it's, shall we call it, an interesting package. Snack. No pressure or anything, my friend, but a casual reminder that this review holds the fate of the very planet we call home in the balance. Kindly choose your words with discretion. Gideon moves around fluidly and will try to surmount anything waist high or lower. Which is saying something, given that everyone in this game appears to have legs like Jessica Rabbit. Seriously, look at them. The humans in this universe have their waist around where the belly button ought to be. <laughs> Snackman, seriously, don't get carried away here. When in narrow environments, particularly the ship where we first get our combat and movement tutorials, Gideon moves at a brisk and unfrustrating pace. However, it comes with the drawback that there is no run command, or at least not one that I could get to function, and that at some point during my recording this footage, an update or something on the Steam version completely broke my control scheme. Seriously, I boot up the game and load my checkpoint of this driving segment, and the camera is flying around in circles. I'm not touching anything. Moving the mouse the opposite way fights it a little, I guess. Unless I go too high or too low, in which case it just causes it all to lose control and spiral in the opposite direction. Oh dear, that is unpleasant to watch. Please take that footage off the screen. Thankfully, I'm not the only one to ever suffer this issue. Special thanks to Lord Dake Kai and your excellent step-by-step -step guide on how to correct this issue, or I might not have been able to do this review at all. For all the good it's presently doing. Snack, focus. Right, right, right. Those bugs are actually very minor because next we get to the prologue's run and gun gameplay, which is very satisfying. The game has aim assist on by default, which helps stupid snacks like myself while playing the game. I actually went all in on lost mouse controls for this and I still felt just a bit inept. In fact, some directional inputs seemed to confuse Gideon as even when I was trained on the enemy, he sometimes just Shot off to the side as if I was strafing... <sighs> Odd, but not crippling, at least. Around here, I learned two of the game's major mechanics. The fact that there's an RPG-styled stat-building element, and that in many instances, enemies just respawn indefinitely, so the old standby of finding enemies to find the exit doesn't always necessarily work. Fun story, though. I was actually under the impression I needed to wipe out the invading aliens in the particular corridor, so I burned through all the ammo I had for all of my human-made weapons. Eventually, I just discarded them for the alien rifles, akimbo of course, because I never pass up the chance to live out my John Woo-inspired action sequences, and proceeded to rank up my mastery of the Acolyte rifle for the entire prologue segment. Eventually, my level was so high I noticed the bullets would arc slightly, in order to hit targets if I was ever off my mark, and my shots doing a lot more damage to enemies than theirs were to me. This implies that, in my habit of nicking ammo off of my enemies, I became more skilled with their armaments than they ever were. Uh -huh. Have you no pride? Using alien tech? You say pride, I say combat pragmatism. One of those goeth before the fall, and it isn't how I handled myself. Interestingly, because I am a total spaz, I also jumped a lot more than was necessary, and I learned that jumping has its own stat and it's shared with a dodge mechanic. Cue Gideon doing Matrix-style dodge dives every which way, and being able to move faster by taking small skips forward than walking like a normal person. You were traversing the levels like a Skyrim protagonist? Huh? Yeah, more or less. That said, major props to the art and design teams. Even the claustrophobic tunnels of the ship have a lot of personality, and the environmental destruction sequences show just what Unreal Engine 2 could do, even if some sliding objects seem to be weighted more heavily than others, so to speak. Like the time a large plate of metal slid over a couple of inches, which completely crushed and executed Gideon, who, in all actuality, would have had his ankle slightly bumped by it. But seriously, this is overall really great art design. 
The enemies are color coded to their overall rank and power and have this weird reptile centaur bug thing going on that makes them all very distinct at a glance. Even in the midst of battlefields where things would get crazy chaotic, I was very easily able to discern friend from foe. No friendly firing here. Not so friendly on the receiver side, is it? On the other side of that, however, is the overall level layout, which could have used a bit more polish. The maps are huge, and that's to their credit, but it often makes navigation somewhat frustrating. There's no goal marker, map, or compass that I could find in my 10 hours of playtime, so I felt a lot of the time I was just kind of guessing on where the flow of the level was supposed to end up taking me. Aww, is the poor, dumb little snack unable to find his way through the essentially linear levels? Do we need to turn the game down to easy mode so you don't hurt your little head too? I, uh, had limited time, so I did play on easy mode. Wow, when you disappoint, you really disappoint. Woohoo! <laughs> Not me this time. Bro, easy mode? Seriously? That is so crazy. Look, like this mission here, once we touch down on the human colony planet after we escape the ship, we get this really cool vehicle segment, and I gotta say, I love the vehicle segments in this game. They're a little unwieldy, but it's so much fun to just go plowing through alien enemies with a nigh-indestructible, heavily armed jeep with limitless turbo boosts to let me mix that jeep do stunts out of a James Bond film. Second favorite weapon in the game, vehicular manslaughter. That said, by the end, I'm going up and down these ramp segments, and at times I'm pulling off things where I'm thinking, wait, was I supposed to do that, or was that a bug? Did the devs intend for me to come here? There's no end marker, as I said, so I just trust my instinct and hope that I hit a load zone before I drive off the edge of the map. The level navigation leaves a bit to be desired, even if the process of navigating them remains immensely entertaining the entire time you're doing it. A later example of this comes up too, as we rush this alien ship a few scenarios later. Oh yeah, I have force powers now, and those are my favorite weapons in the game. In fact, once I got the first two, I quit carrying guns with me altogether because they felt redundant. Between the fact that I could bug flick aliens off the side of their own ship and into planetary orbit, and the other just being a concussive shockwave that can destroy three story tall battle mecha, guns just felt useless. But here, as I'm really exploring my newfound abilities, I find that the logical path to the ship's bridge is not where I need to go ultimately, even though one of the subquests does mandate doing so. I backtrack a little, and upon my return, even my NPC allies just vanish. Wow. They actually got tired of waiting for you and just moved on to the next level of the mission without you. I was stuck here for, no lie, about 45 minutes trying to figure out what I was doing wrong. Upon first finding the door textures here in this level set, you quickly learn that they almost never open. But this new leg adds a new wrinkle. If there's a green light above them, that indicates if they're open. So once I learned to look for this, I went back literally as far as the game would allow me to backtrack and in the corner of the random elevator shaft we entered from is suddenly another door that is now unlocked. <sighs> okay, whatever. I get back to destroying aliens and enjoying myself. Even when the game frustrates me, there remains this, oh, I see what you're doing there kind of feeling. The game devs were not inept. There's a method to the madness. I can feel it in every aspect of the design. And speaking of, this is also the same area I first took note of the soundtrack. All in all, it's really good stuff. It's an ideal mix of pulse-pounding action tracks and beautifully ambient background sounds. Special props, of course, to the game's opening vocal track, Greater Lights, a standout of the OST. It's all just really well done. Now, the voice cast, meanwhile, eh, it's a mixed bag. The main cast, like Gideon, Olivia, and Marin, all do a solid job of their performance, but a lot of the extras just sound a bit wooden. But honestly, I like my sci-fi with a dash of extra ham and cheese, so I think that worked well for me. You also get interesting things like how human soldiers will banter among themselves, but will also just break out screaming for help randomly at times, even if they're in no actual immediate danger. Kinda random like that. Huh, no. I'm pushing the fire button. No, wait, Snakina, you, you haven't heard the rest of the review all the way through. Right, Snack? Huh? Yeah, sure. Okay, whatever you say, buddy. Wrap it up, you silly little Snack. All right, all right, keep your tie on. If you looked at the reviews and the reception to Advent Rising when it first debuted, you'd see a morass of negativity. Bugs everywhere, a clunky flick targeting system, a contest that never resolved, and more. But if you look at reviews from that time, you'll notice a certain theme more often than not. 
Mostly that theme being people who play the game for about an hour and then quit, never giving the game a meaningful chance. I know this because in my many hours of playing the transition going from run and gun to run and god where I was casually reflecting service to air missiles with the flat of one hand and firing honest to goodness key blasts from the other was so sudden and deliciously cathartic. The first time I got the throw power I was hurling seekers off their own ship one after another, cackling like a snack possessed all the while. Yes, I did encounter some bugs, yes, I encountered some questionable level design, and yes, I died a few times despite my best efforts. Like, for example, the time when I was trying to activate a switch and I had to dodge roll into it for it to register that I pushed the action button. But, darn it, I enjoyed this game. Uh, wait, you did? Y you did? You've been ragging on it this whole time. Oh, it is a very deeply flawed game that should have been given at least a couple more months of development time in order to hash some of these issues out, but how can I not love it? It's this crazy, over-the-top space opera where I go from Captain Boring Pants with some alien tech I pilfered to suddenly flying around crushing spaceships with my mind and dealing with heartfelt losses, betrayals, and political drama. This is insanity, and I love every waking moment of it. I mean, in the opening few minutes, the game literally gives you the dark choice of saving either your own brother or your fiancé. Talk about twisting a knife. You saved your brother, correct? <laughs> no. Remind me to never go to space with you. <laughs> I can't tell if you're being facetious or you're just bad lacking in self-awareness. And the next thing I know, I'm essentially an alien messianic figure crushing an army of evil in an ever-escalating psychic arms race? This game's amazing! I am so sad that I slept on it all these years. Sure, it's rough. Sure, the proportions are strange. And sure, some lines of dialogue even I could have read better. But I don't care. I was fully on board with the whole thing. I loved the gunplay. I loved the superpowers. I was intrigued by the weird three-way species war between the fish people and the reptile centaurs. I was in the story and loving every single moment of it. And the fact that the original team doesn't even hold the license to it at this point, and that it's been almost 18 years without a follow-up, that's a legitimate shame. And it makes me sad. This was insane and immensely fun, and the fact that we won't likely ever see a follow-up to it is genuinely troubling. I loved Advent Rising, flaws and all that that entails. So, what's the score? What? What score? Every game review has to end with a numeric value on a scale of 1 to 10. Everyone knows that. Wait, they do? Mm, well, I mean a lot do. It's how IGN gave Imagine Babies a higher score than God Hand. It just kind of proves that an arbitrary numeric value doesn't actually mean anything at all, huh? Today, please. Well, I mean, it's a good game with some flaws, so I can't just say that it's a 10, so maybe, like, somewhere between a 7 and an 8? Wait, did you just give my favorite movie of all time a 7.8 out of 10? I don't know. Maybe? That's it. I'm blowing up the world. What? Why? What'd I do? I gave it a good score. You fool. Seven out of ten is what game reviewers give to games that they want to say suck, but they cannot because their parent companies are being paid by the game companies. I don't read game journal garbage. What do we do now? Now? Well, gee, I don't know, Snack. Maybe we can all accept the fact that in 60 seconds the world will be in an ocean of ecto-cooler and crystal Pepsi, and it's all your fault. I like Ecto Cooler and Crystal Pepsi. Not, Not now, Snecko. Now, Snecko. <laughs> Gentlemen, please. It's uncool to fight amongst bros. Lounge Lizard? Do you have some sort of plan? As a matter of fact, I do. But it's a fate that I had wished that I could spare my two dearest friends from. Hey, don't do anything rash now, buddy. <laughs> no, no, guys. This is something I must accept of my own accord. Even though today I am but a lowly MS Paint object lazily cobbled together for a singular visual gag, in my next life I might be, who knows, a full-blown sets art asset like Snack. Yeah, sorry about that, by the way, Snackworth. Money's been tight this year. You're forgiven. Might as well get it out of the way before the Pepsi Geddon. There will be no Pepsi Geddon today, guys. I'm gonna stop the cannon in the only way I know how. With my body. What? No, don't do that. No one would ever ask you to do that. No, you mustn't. 
I'm afraid the script is too long, guys. So the time for debate is over. I'm off. There goes the bravest reptile I've ever known. You know, he'll be back for next year's episode, right? Yes, yes, but let's not ruin the moment. Wait, why am I still in the space station? Where is Snack? Snack? Snackina? Where is everyone? Hi, big brother. G goodness me, Snacko. What are you doing here? Uh, I haven't really been written in the character motivation yet, so I'm going to, right? Uh, just, just get out of the space station. Well, he's got the shades on his face, head slicked back, not a scale out of place, and he's on the attack. Gonna take his car, drive it across the lands, but how can he drive when he's got no hands? Cause he's snack. Yeah, he's snack. Internet jail, now he's on the outside. Lounge Lizard and Snackworth along for the ride. Got a wholesome snack ass to the explodinator. See if they have the skills of an expert negotiator. He's snack. Yeah, he's snack. And that's fine.